Yeah, so thanks everyone for joining. Uh, there's a lot of information today. Um, it's both a little bit of theory and um, practical application or practical ways to um, avoid the signal integrity issues that can occur. So it's a, I think it's a great, uh, a great session today. And we also have um, our design team uh, available to answer questions as you may ask in the Q&A section. And as well at the end, uh, we can have a live session if, um, if you wish to do that. So today's webinar is the design essentials to maintain signal integrity in class two and class three PCBs. Uh, one slide about Sierra. So at the bottom, you can see that we really provide the full uh, levels of services uh, from complex PCBs to standard PCBs, uh, assembly, uh, component services. Uh, we recently added a supply chain uh, department uh, and also acquired a company in Wisconsin that does mass production. So we're really trying to provide the full suite of services to our customers. Uh, so I'm presenting and Atar uh, also would be here for questions and answers, but please ask your questions uh, during the presentation so that the design team can answer. So this is what we'll be going through today. I wanted to quickly start off with the difference between class two and class three PCBs. There's really only a few things from a layout perspective that are different, like you need to add um, complete, uh, you know, larger annular rings. Um, but also the stack up is critical in how a board will be built and maintaining a copper wrap. So class two boards are typically used in, you know, laptops, tablets, consumer electronics, where class three boards are have applications in medical devices, military, aero, anything that needs to be more reliable. Class two has allows you to have a visual defects. Uh, and as I was talking about a breakout in drill, but uh, class three does not accept any of those things. So knowing what class you're designing to or what your board will finally be in production is important. So you can design your, your via sizes uh, and your pad sizes appropriately to maintain the required annular ring. Uh, so, and that plays a role in signal integrity. So the prerequisites, re prerequisites for signal integrity. So I, I just want you to know the basic signal integrity signifies the signal's ability to traverse through PCB traces without distortion. It is the capability to accurately reconstruct the transmitted waveform at the receiver. So there are two main aspects. Do the signals perform the desired functions properly at the receiver? For example, the frequency components should follow the same amount of amplitude change. And two, do the signals reach their destination within the determined time windows? This implies the frequency components of the signal should have the same time shift or delay. The most critical reason for signal integrity issues on a PCB is the quick signal rise times. So when circuits and devices operate at low to moderate frequencies with moderate rise time, signal integrity problems are rarely an issue. However, when working with at higher frequencies with a much shorter rise time, signal integrity problems definitely occur. So when there's signal integrity issues, um, you'll see this in the shape of the signal gets distorted, the signal to noise ratio degrades, signal is susceptible to extraneous electrical noise and EMI from other devices. The signal induces EMI to other electrical circuits, either connected to or near nearby. Propagation delay occurs while transmitting a group of signals. So ask yourself, what are the most common causes that lead to this uh, signal integrity issues? So 
So we can categorize the signal integrity issues into these nine factors. So the first one, impedance uh, discontinuity. If the signal encounters a discontinuity in impedance during its transmission, it will suffer reflections that cause signal distortion. So line impedance discontinuities are prevalently observed at starting and terminating ends of a signal, intersection points of a signal with a via or connector pin, splits in the return path or reference plane, uh, and most important, via or trace stubs. So to avoid this, you can minimize signal distortion due to line impedance discontinuities by using smaller microvias and HDI technology to reduce the effects of discontinuities caused by vias and via stubs. Route the traces in daisy chain fashion rather than multi-drop branches. Incorporate termination resistors at the source and the destination ends and use tightly coupled differential pairs that are inherently more immune to discontinuities in signal return path or planes. Obviously this plays a role in your stack up and we have lots of information on stack vias, staggered vias and back drill on our blog, which you should definitely know about. So here we're gonna do a quick demo of our impedance calculator. The demo is gonna be done by uh, Pranav. So I'll stop sharing. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let me just stop sharing. Sure. Hello, hello everyone. Yeah. Uh, so this is uh, our impedance calculator tool, and this tool is uh, based on the numerical solutions of Maxwell's equation, and it renders very accurate results. And so the results can be used for manufacturing and as well as the signal integrity analysis. So our tool is hosted on our website www.protoexpress.com, and you can check out the tool. So we have uh, about 82 different impedance models uh, based on different geometry and different structure. And all the models are available uh, for you uh, if you log in to our website. So you can choose uh, the type of structure. So you can have uncoated microstrip, uh, coated microstrip, embedded microstrip, strip line, and uh, choose single-ended or differential pair model. Uh, it can be non-coplanar, non -co we have coplanar single-ended, coplanar differential pair. We also have coplanar single-ended uh, without ground models and also a differential pair without ground models if you are working with, uh, uh, without ground models. Also, you can see we have a basic models and we also have a composite dielectric model wherein uh, if you have multiple dielectrics, then you can choose a composite model wherein uh, it will take into account uh, the difference, uh, different dielectric composition. So let's take a look at coated microstrip differential pair. You click on the open button and it will open up the calculator that you want to work with. So this is a uh, coated microstrip differential pair calculator. Uh, you need to give basic information, the dielectric information, a trace information. Uh, the inputs will be in mils. You can change the units to inches. If you're working in metric system, you can use micrometer, millimeter, centimeter. The default value will be mils. So you can enter, uh, you need to enter the dielectric parameters like dielectric height, dielectric constant. Let's say four mil uh, dielectric constant is 3.84. Now for this coated geometry, you need to enter parameters for coating height. So uh, the coating heights are generally taken as <clears throat> what is that the equal to same as your trace thickness. So I'll take this as 1.45 and 1.45. Uh, the height H2C is the dialect, uh, the coating above the trace. So it is generally taken as 0.5 mils. So if you have higher coating, you can change this value. I need to enter the uh, coating dielectric constant. This is 4.2 for solder mask. And you can change this value as per uh, your requirement. Then for trace information, I uh, need to enter parameters like delta W. Now delta W is a difference between the bottom of the trace width and top of the trace width. 
so as we know the trace is not it doesn't have a rectangular shape and it takes a trapezoidal shape so delta w is the factor which takes care of that uh, difference in trace weight uh, the delta w it depends on the starting copper so we have given a table so you can click on the help button so this table provides you like what delta w value you need to choose depending on the starting copper so this this table has values in mils and we also have a table uh, with mm so you can choose accordingly depending on your starting copper uh stake trace thickness is 1.45 and let's say i have a separation of 6 mils now i can enter uh, target impedance and calculate trace width or i can enter trace width and calculate the impedance so both ways the calculator works so let's check out what will be our trace width for 100 ohms differential pair um you need to press the calculate button near the trace width and it will calculate the trace width for this uh, target impedance uh, you can see the calculated impedance uh, there are more parameters like coupling coefficient or more even more impedances propagation delay or an even mode and sure uh, so you can also change the trace width so let's say 4.5 and you can calculate the impedance for this particular uh, trace width so now the impedance changed to 99.62 ohms and also the other parameters also changed so you can click on the show more parameters wherein the uh, inductance and capacitance of the traces are also given calculated so you can observe those if you if you wish to know um, those parameters also we have uh, a material construction table which you can use so if you don't know what uh, what values to enter like what will be your dielectric uh, pre uh, prepreg or core um dielectric constant and dissipation factor we have this table where you can refer uh, so they have different thicknesses we have list of materials to choose from and you can uh take a look at uh, what are the dielectric constant and dissipation factor for different thicknesses for different resin content also for this geometry if you want to have uh, if you want to do a signal loss calculation uh, you can change the tab to signal loss calculator here you need to enter uh, the dissipation factor of the dielectric of, of the dielectric that is present so, so these inputs may vary depending on the calculator that you have selected so there can be more inputs here so uh, you need to give signal loss input say 10 gigahertz uh, standard surface uh, surface roughness and say i have a two inch line you can click on the calculate loss button and this will calculate the losses we calculate the conductor loss dielectric loss insertion loss these are all per unit length and also the total insertion loss so these uh, losses are calculated for odd mode and even mode for the differential pair uh, we also have a crosstalk calculator so for uh, for the this selected geometry uh, you can check out uh, <clears throat> well, uh, how much of crosstalk will be present from the aggressor line to the victim line so you can the input parameters required here are like coupled trace length so how long the both the traces are coupled so say they are coupled for two inches the signal rise time on the aggressor line say i have 100 picoseconds and the input signal voltage say two volts click on calculate crosstalk and we see the near end crosstalk results wherein we calculate the near end crosstalk uh, the near end voltage that you observe on the near end side of the victim line and this is the saturation length also for far end results we calculate uh, and display far end crosstalk uh, the far end voltage is the maximum voltage that you will see on the victim line and then we also display the coupling uh, fext coefficient kf so to do the loss and crosstalk calculation you need to enter parameters in impedance calculator as the dielectric and trace information is taken from the impedance calculator so you need to first do the impedance calculation and then you can move on to the loss and the crosstalk calculation 
so we'll talk about loss and crosstalk further in the uh, webinar. So, uh, uh, thank you, Pranav. Yeah. And then yeah. uh, I'm going to talk about uh, reflections and ringing, and then yes. you have another transmission line reflection calculator demo, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. So multiple reflections will cause ringing. And so whenever the impedance changes in a circuit, the outgoing signal bounces back toward the source and interferes with the transmitting pulses. The reflected signal will travel back until it encounters another change in impedance and gets reflected again. So this will cause oscillating voltage or current due to a change in input, and this is called ringing. Overshooting occurs when the transient value of the signal exceeds the steady state. Undershooting happens when the transient value is lower than the final value. So how would you reduce reflection? You want to maintain trace uniformity. Uh, you want to ensure source and destination impedance matches with transmission line impedance. You want to use a series of uh, terminating resistors and place it near the source uh, point. And the series termination resistor should be placed with within one sixth of a wavelength of the switching speed of the driver. So you definitely need to speak to us about stack of material selection choices and uh, things like that as well. So uh, Parnov is going to back to Parnov for a quick demo on the transmission line reflection calculator. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we have uh, a simple demonstrative tool which you can use to uh, see how the voltage voltage level will vary at the input and output end of the transmission line due to impedance discontinuity. So you need to give, uh, we have input parameters like uh, source impedance, uh, let's say 16 ohms, the line impedance, let's say we have 50 ohm line impedance, uh, load, load impedance. Uh, you need to give a signal launch step voltage, say one volt, and you need to give the total propagation time. So how much time the signal will take to reach to the uh, other end of the trace. And you can press calculate. And the tool will calculate and generate the graph for both voltages at the input and voltage at the output end of the line. And as you can see, because of the impedance discontinuity, the it takes a lot of cycles for the signal to settle. And at both input and output end, you can see um, ripples. Yep. Yep. So also you can uh, click on the show calculations button and this will give you like at each uh, time, how much voltage will be present on the input end and output end of the line and see the entire table here. So this table is represented in terms of graph. So this is the um, reflection tool. Okay. Back to you. Okay. Okay. Thanks Prana. Yes. So via stub, uh, via stub is a part um, that remains non-functional during signal transmission. It acts like a resonant circuit with a specific resonant frequency and causes reflection of signals from the stub end. Signal attenuation occurs if the signal has a component at or near that resonant frequency or the odd harmonics of it. So ensure the maximum frequency component of the signal is less than the fundamental resonant frequency of the stub. To minimize the discontinuity introduced by via stubs, adapt uh, back drilling uh, techniques uh, where most of the via stub is removed by redrilling with a slightly larger size drill bit. If you don't have the space on your design, you can always use uh, blind vias and buried vias. Design your vias such that their impedance is equivalent to the trace impedance. So there's some amazing blogs on our website that really go into detail about via stubs. 
um, I highly recommend that you take a look. Uh, and uh, Pranav will quick quick uh, demo for from Pranav on that on our stub calculator. Thank you. Yeah. As you can see, yeah. So uh, this this is uh, our maximum uh, via stub length calculator tool. So as you have seen, the stub length uh, acts as a resonant circuit. So uh, for the input parameters for this tool, uh, you have need to enter the dielectric constant, let's say four, and you can give any one of these four parameters. You can either enter a data transfer rate or fastest rise time, maximum frequency content uh, or 3 dB bandwidth. So let's say uh, I have maximum frequency content of 20 gigahertz and you need to press the calculate button. So this tool will calculate what is the maximum stub length that you can have. So you can see that we have calculated like 0 0.041 inches. So about 41, 42 mils of uh, stub length is the maximum. More than this may cause uh, high signal degradation. Uh, if the stub length is more than this, yeah, it will cause high signal degradation. You can calculate, you, you, you can also calculate uh, what is the maximum frequency content that you can have given uh, via stub length. So let's say I have uh, a 50 mil or uh, 0 0.05 uh, inches via stub. So I'll enter that value and press the calculate button. And this will calculate how much of uh, maximum frequency content that kind that that, that it can have without uh, uh, high signal degradation due to reflection. So we also calculate the maximum data transfer rate, fastest rise time and bandwidth. So given any one parameter, the tool will calculate all the other parameters. Oh. Yeah. So you can, you can change the fastest rise time and do the calculation. So if you have maximum data transfer rate you can enter that value and you can do the calculation and to calculate the maximum via stub length for that uh, data transfer rate allowable uh, via stub length for the data transfer rate yeah. okay. yes okay thank you yeah, back to you Amit. all right thank you yes So also consider your trace stub. So long trace stubs may act as antennas and radiate, and this rule will create reflections and increase problems in complying with EMC standards. So adapt a daisy chain routing to minimize the effect of pull-up or pull-down resistors. In your PCB design, if you have uh, a keep-out area as well, uh, make sure you put that on your fabrication drawing so the fabricator doesn't add their logo and copper in that area. That's always funny when that happens. Uh, so propagation delay and length matching. So if the data signals and clock signals do not match, they arrive at different times at the receiver. This causes signal skews. Excessive skew can cause signal sampling errors. The signal delays are directly proportional to the trace lengths and inversely proportional to the signal speed. Signal skews can be minimized by matching the length of signal traces and implement serpentine traces to achieve proper length matching. The objective is to match the propagation delay by matching the length. So for crosstalk, Crosstalk occurs when there is a coupling of energy from the aggressor signal to the victim signal due to EMI. The electric field is coupled via mutual capacitance between the signals. On the other hand, the magnetic field is coupled via mutual inductance between the signals. Rapid voltage and current transitions induce voltages in adjacent traces due to inductive and capacitive coupling. So these voltages spikes are known as crosstalk and may cause data errors. So we're looking to launch a crosstalk calculator uh, based on the 2D electromagnetic field analysis. So best practices to reduce crosstalk, avoid right angles, uh, increase the spacing between signal lines as much as routing restrictions allow, 
place the conductor as close to the ground plane as possible. Ideally, it should be one dielectric away. Implement differential signaling as far as possible to eliminate the common mode noise. Route the signals on different layers, keep them orthogonal to each other, reduce parallel run lengths between signals. Signal attenuation is degradation of signal amplitude. It's largely caused by the losses in the conductor and the dielectric material used. Conductor loss increases with trace resistance and frequency, whereas dielectric loss increases with dissipation factor and loss tangent. If you're looking on a high-speed application, choose a material with lower loss tangent and dissipation factor to avoid attenuation. So opt for the low resistance traces and copper foils with very low roughness profiles to minimize signal attenuation. Until so generally lower profile copper exhibits lower signal losses. The so ground bounce occurs when the circuit Re reference level shifts from the original level during transistor switching. This is primarily due to ground rail and signal in interconnecting impedances. To decrease ground bounce, implement decoupling capacitors to local ground, incorporate serially connected current limiting resistors, use individual vias and traces for ground plane connections. So on to PDN. When devices, uh, output signals, and internal gates switch states, currents through power and ground planes change, causing a voltage drop in power and ground planes. This is referred to as PDN noise. The quick signal transition time causes higher number of lines to switch states, leading to voltage decreases across power and ground rails. So how do you minimize this? To reduce the PDN noise, the impedance of a power system should be as low as possible. To achieve this, consider the following guidelines. Place the power and ground planes close together to reduce the parasitic capacitance. Use multiple low inductance decoupling capacitors across power and ground rails and place them close to the power and ground pins. Use device packages with short leads. On to EMI. Electromagnetic disturbances Disturbance is where energy is transmitted through radiation or conduction from one electronic device to another. It's mainly caused by EMI emission, electromagnetic radiation that disturbs the system itself or the neighboring devices, and susceptibility to EM radiation is the vulnerability of an electronic electrical device to external EM radiation. So, how do you avert EMI? Many techniques that we have discussed so far will help you reduce the EMI in your design. So apart from these, here are some other important methods. Employ a Faraday cage, which can be created by adding ground feature on the edge of the PCB. Uh, do not route signals outside of the boundary. This technique restricts the EMI emission. Use a ground plane or route the return path under the signal line to minimize the loop area. Floating copper areas should always be grounded, otherwise it may act as an antenna, causing EMC issues. Employ shielding on the cables to minimize parasitic capacitance and inductance. Signal integrity analysis. To analyze signal integrity in a system, perform simulation and measurement of a channel concurrently. Compare the data from each analysis. If they correlate, you can conclude the signal integrity is established in your system. You can proceed to the next design steps. Channel simulation involves I pattern, mixed mode S parameters, and TDR simulation. Simulation helps to extract electrical parameters and the actual behavior of the circuit board. It identifies the root cause of signal degradation before producing a prototype. It takes layout files as input data and it deduces impedance matrices, full wave EMI calculations, and propagation delay. Stimulation results in both of the time and frequency domains are compared with the measured results.
So S parameters are used to detail how energy can propagate through an electrical network. It is particularly used to represent the bidirectional behavior at input and output ports of an electric electrical network. Mixed mode S parameters for high speed designs. For high speed designs, use differential pairs instead of single ended ones. Mixed mode S parameters are used to analyze differential pairs. Differential response is a four port measurement with 16 S parameters. Mixed mode S parameters provide insights into how the transmission reacts to differential and common signals. The upper left quadrant describes the signal's actual behavior and performance. The upper right and lower left are the mixed mode parameters that describe EMI and crosstalk. These mode conversion parameters explain the exact location of problems through multi-domain analysis. VNA measures the power of a high-speed signal that goes into and comes out of a component or network. S parameters are analyzed using vector network analyzers. It includes source that creates a known stimulus signal and a single or group of receivers to detect the changes in the stimulus signal caused by the device under test. It captures both the amplitude and phase of the signal at every point. The fundamentals of an eye pattern, it's a graphical representation of how a channel degrades a signal. It represents all possible positive and negative transitions and both data states on a single screen. Overall image looks like an eye. That's why it's called an eye diagram. Ideally, the data should match the previous response. However, the composite image appears blurry due to signal integrity issues such as jitter and noise, where jitter causes blur in the horizontal direction and noise causes blur in the vertical direction. It helps the designers to identify problems like slow rise time, intersymbol interference, and attenuation levels. Here we have a channel with a transmitter and a receiver. On the transmitter side, the eye is open zero and one levels can be spotted easily. When the signal traverses the channel and reaches the receiver, the eye is almost closed and is tough for the receiver to differentiate as zero or one. This is the point where the signal integrity problems occur. TDR tester incidents a signal on the device under test to measure signal reflections as they pass through a transmission medium. If the conductor has a uniform impedance and is properly terminated, then there will be zero reflections. On the contrary, if there are impedance variations, some of the incident signals will be reflected back to the source. TDR compares these reflections with those generated by standard impedance. It generates a graphical representation of discontinuities based on the timing phase and amplitude of the reflected waveform. And it, and it precisely deduces the location and nature of the electrical discontinuity as shown in the image. That does it for our slide, and we are open for questions and answers. We have a question in the Q&A section. Uh, if this is a thought here, let me try to answer that. The maximum data rate, the maximum frequency in a signal content, and the rise time of the pulse, all these three things are related to each other. The rise time is generally referred to as 10% to 90% uh, of the pulse uh, shape. And uh, I think that is possibly the answer that you were expecting, Mr. Fry.
Thank you, Atta. We have another question. Point, do you need to start rounding the corners on the sine wave tune from 45 degrees? One gigahertz less. I think one gigahertz is a fairly good indication. Designing a high current board more than 10 MPS with three, four hours this board as well as high speed design. Wow, so you have a high power board and also a high speed design. What kind of maximum frequency are we talking about? So for the high current board, of course, you will go with uh, the high current traces and we have a calculator to calculate the right kind of conductor widths and conductor uh, to withstand those temperatures for a uh, given amount of ambient uh, temperature rise uh, above how much temperature rise above the ambient you can tolerate. And uh, for the high speed portion of the is, I think one will go through the uh, impedance analysis, the propagation delay analysis, the signal loss analysis, etc. I think in your case, it looks like to me as if when you are having a high power board, naturally your conductors. Now, when we're talking of the high speed, we are talking of signals. And we are talking of high current board. Is that for the signals, uh, conductors, as well as for the power and other things? Because these are two different uh, sets of things. One are the power conductors, power and return conductors, and another set is the signal conductors. So, so for the high speed design, I believe that would be the signal con uh, conductors domain and the power high current board would be the basically the power and the return paths. Nick's power design, I could not get the uh, question very clearly what do you mean by mixed power design? Are you talking of analog and digital mixing? I think it was a follow up on the question that you just answered regarding uh, high current. Okay. And okay, okay. What battery tolerance should I give fabricators? Mainly curious how short, I think two to three mils is fine enough. About two mils is also okay. I think now, in our manufacturing, uh, we really are able to control the back uh, very effectively. So two mils should be okay. I diagram percentage opening. Uh, is there anyone else who can give this answer? I don't have right now. I think at least it should be, uh, I mean, it, it depends upon the noise budget that you have at the receiving end, but roughly 50% uh, opening, I would tend to believe should be okay. Historically used exclusively single-ended microstep line, even though many of our signals are differential. With increasing channel kind, we are running out of room. Okay, I was thinking the differential routing could fit in a small space. Yes, if, see the differential routing can, uh, the space between the, uh, if you have a, let us say density of traces problem on the board design, then the differential lines can be designed to have a smaller spacing and a higher coupling between them. Of course, the, when you reduce the spacing, you have to reduce the trace width as well to achieve the same differential impedance. So that uh, definitely some kind of an, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, optimization can be done depending upon the uh, real estate available, definitely. 
And if you're using single-ended microstrips for even for differential signals, primarily you would be basically, you know, putting them slightly far apart so that they don't have too much of coupling between them. Otherwise the impedance is going to, you know, decrease. Uh, the impedance uh, that we are talking of in the calculator, we have all kinds of geometries, the strip lines as well as micro strips. I think what was demonstrated was micro strip, but we have the strip lines also with multiple, uh, let us say, complex, uh, multiple sets of uh, combinations of dielectrics layers. And uh, the dielectric layer, which is nearest to the signal, is the most significant. The remaining ones can be basically combined together into a single effective dielectric layer. And we have these coplanars and all those kind of things. So the impedance model is, you know, almost there are 84 or more than 84 different models in our impedance calculator. And the one of the things, beauties of our impedance calculator is it gives you straight away the, the what do you call the propagation delay also for both, especially if it is differential mode, then for both even mode as well as uh, for you know even and odd modes, common and uh, differential modes, and also if you want to go further into the capacitance parameters, you know what are the mutual capacitances, what are the mutual inductances, what are the mutual you know single in inductances per unit length, etc. All those parameters are available for you. Basically, the results of the entire solution of the two-dimensional Ma Maxwell's equations uh, for uh, parameter extraction, they're all there, effectively. Yes, there is a... Uh, uh, Amit, why don't you answer this SDI cost and non-SDI boards? Uh, sure. So I view the question as if a low complexity HDI is uh, with one lamination, but blind via on the outer layer, if that's what is meant by low complexity HDI, then uh, to add a laser drill to your design is around $450 per lot manufactured. Um, and then you can amortize that over the number of pieces, et cetera. But that's the... Um, that's the minimum cost to just go into the laser drill room and get a laser drill. Done. And it will increase the time a little bit more. Yeah. 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 Um, maybe it may add one more day to fabrication. And a high complexity HDI is one that has uh, very fine or dense trace in space, plus the many laminations, like three or four sequential laminations. That's a high complexity HDI. Let, let me answer the question about the mentor graphics, hyperlinks, and expedition. Basically, they are all uh, similar calculators based on the, you know, the numerical solution of uh, Max, uh, Maxwell's two-dimensional equations. I mean, the hyperlinks, we have compared our results with the hyperlinks as well as with the polar, and uh, our calculator is quite fine. The reason why we made this calculator is so that all the community, all the, you know, the electronics engineers community, which do not all of them have access to, you know, uh, this uh, expensive hyperlinks and, uh, you know, um, poor calculators. So that's the, our idea was to make a sophisticated, up-to-date technology calculators available to the engineering, electronic engineering community at large. I think that was our intention. It is, our, our calculator is fairly accurate. It will compare with dipolings now. Yeah. What are the benefits and drawbacks of coated traces? Uh, coating, of course, is done primarily for, you know, so that the copper does not get corroded. That's that is how the solar mass coating is used. Uh, if you are talking of other coatings, then they are basically to tolerate some harsh environments. 
conditions, etc. I mean, when you uh, do conformal coatings and all that, there are varieties of coatings, right? Naturally, they are not, uh, they have a effect because their high frequency characteristics are not very good. So they definitely uh, create a issue in terms of attenuation and all that stuff, yeah. Is it better to have thermal reliefs on 0, 02, 0, 01 and 0402 parts or copper flood the connections? Will copper flooding the pads cause storm stoning or billboarding? See, uh, in, let me put it this way. For 0201 and 0402, I think uh, rounding of the Pads. This is related to assembly and how the solder mask is deposited. Oh, sorry, how the solder paste is deposited. So therefore, uh, that is, uh, there are, for 04, uh, 0201 and 0402, you don't have to do uh, too much except possibly rounding the things at the time of the, uh, you know, the stencils is made. That is a part of, uh, especially in CR circuits, you know, we have a quite a large protocol of how a stencil should be designed for various apertures. So that, of course, is taken care of over there. And uh, thermal reliefs really are not needed for these kind of things too much. See, thermal reliefs is, <laughs> is a situation which, let us say, coming to us from 1960s, 70s, many times they are really not needed, I think. But, but having them does not cause much of a harm, okay? Thermal mass difference is what will cause an issue during a sample. That is true, but uh, the, uh, you know, The kind of thermal relief that you will design for a bigger pad and for a smaller pad would be different, would be different. I mean, maybe the amount of, I don't know, I mean, that's what I feel. What I have generally seen is in many designs, there are no thermal reliefs from customers. In some of them, there are thermal reliefs and both of them go through the assembly process uh, in the modern assembly processes recently. This thermal relief, when well, most of the soldering used to be done by hand or by wave soldering, you know, at that time it used to be a big issue, but not anymore. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I think that's it, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Atta, for answering the questions. Thank you, Amit, for the presentation. Uh, we will send you the slides and recording tomorrow. In the meantime, if you have any questions, you can send me an email, and uh, we will provide you with an answer. Very quickly. There is one uh, uh, point that I would like to add. Yes. Is that, uh, you know, we, uh, in this uh, presentation, we covered the PDN, the power distribution network noise, only cursorily. That's a topic by itself and how to really solve that in a great detail and all that. And we will possibly come with some webinar on that issue later on. We are also in the process of creating a very effective tool to estimate some of the PDN noises and all that stuff. PDN, proper PDN design for high frequency applications is extremely important. Thank you. Okay, sounds good. We will do so. Uh, yes, we will send you an email tomorrow and you're going to have the slides and the recording of the webinar. Thank you for now, you did a right, very good job. Okay, thank you everyone.
Yeah. Thank you everyone for joining.